So hello everybody, good morning, thank you for coming. Um, I initially I prepared some some welcome speech, <laughs> but um, I guess we can skip that. <laughs> um, I don't think I need to introduce myself or Katja because all of you are here um, know us already. Um, so I'm happy um, to, to continue our workshop today um, after yesterday's film screening of Enter the Dragon, which was quite quite nice, quite good. So and um, today we will start our workshop with a lecture on Bruce Lee aesthetics and sidekicks by Professor Paul Bowman. And we will then continue with a practical session on Bruce Lee's fighting style with Waldo Brandt, um, who's coming a bit later today. And finally, we'll close our workshop with a roundtable discussion on martial aesthetics before and after Bruce Lee. And there we'll be joined by Dr. Martin Meyer from the University of Fechter. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Dr. Max Rienen from Alpha University uh, cannot join us today because of a uh, very recent COVID infection. So uh, we wish him all the best and a speedy recovery. Um, our first speaker is Professor Paul Bowman from Cardiff University, and I'm very happy to welcome him here in Göttingen. Um, I first met Paul in 2015 during the first Martial Arts Studies Conference at Cardiff University. And at that time I had just started my PhD on Taekwondo practice in South Korea. And uh, being at this conference, which Professor Paul Bowman organized, was uh, was really an eye-opener to a whole new world of discourses and research areas for me. And uh, I had just finished my master's degree at that time on theatricality on, uh, in Taekwondo before that. And at that time, I really had uh, no idea that there could possibly, possibly be also other scholars who were uh, or who shared the same interest as me. So this was um, um, a really... Um, yeah, a really good experience, also professionally, but also personally. And uh, hence, I'm very happy to welcome Paul Bowman uh, for this workshop here in Göttingen. Professor Paul Bowman is a uh, professor of cultural studies at the University of Cardiff and currently serving as a deputy head of the School of Journalism, Media and Culture uh, with focus on cultural theory and popular culture. Bowman has been the director of the Martial Arts Studies Research Network since 2015, organizing international conferences, launching the Martial Arts Studies podcast, and also publishing the journal Martial Arts Studies. His latest monograph, The Invention of Martial Arts, published by Oxford University Press in December 2020, showcases his experience in the field. Paul Bowman is a staunch supporter of open access research contributing significantly to the establishment of Cardiff University Press. As an educator, he teaches modules on film, cultural theory, and media culture, while also supervising MA dissertations and PhD projects on diverse topics. His leadership extends to roles such as director of the Media, Culture, and Creativity Research Group, within JOMAC reflecting his dedication to advancing cultural and martial arts studies through research, publishing, and academic leadership. Please welcome Professor Paul Bohm. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everyone for making the effort. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not embarrassing at all to have a, an introduction like that. So. Um, we we discussed what we should talk about today, and we thought aesthetics um, and Bruce Lee, but um, we kind of decided we should narrow it down to something specific. Um, so we, we'd settled on the, the the image of the sidekick as a kind of um, exemplary case study for thinking about aesthetics and thinking about um, Bruce Lee. So um, I've written about sidekicks before. I think that I think sidekicks are really, really um, important and fascinating case studies. So I've written about it. I've wrote about it lots in in theorizing Bruce Lee, and probably in Beyond Bruce Lee. I can't remember. But I wrote a whole chapter on kicking um, in Mythologies of Martial Arts, 
Um, and also, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today um, is, is in the early chapters of, of, of this book, the, the Invention of Martial Arts, which is especially the kind of media history of, of martial arts. That's the thing that's always interested me, less the, um, less the actual histories. There's a lot of work done on the actual histories of martial arts, right? But the media histories of martial arts, I think, are really, really important and often overlooked in, in proper history. Um, but mm, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to talk about is an argument that I wrote down for Kyle Barrowman's next book, forthcoming book, Fighting Stars. We just got the page proofs for this yesterday. So uh, my chapter is called Bruce Lee, Effective and Affective Action Techniques. In this, in this book, it's all about martial arts action stars, Hong Kong action stars. Um, so we're going to begin. I want you to think about what you think about when you think Bruce Lee. Like, what, do you, what do you think about when you say Bruce Lee? And I'm wondering, is it, is it something like this? We had it yesterday. Yeah, of course you had it yesterday. Is it this? Which is also iconic, I think. Um, is it something like this? Is this the kind of scene that you, that you think of when you think Bruce Lee? Or is it this? Or something like this? The sidekick. So what I want to talk about is, I think the sidekicks, and I think that a lot of the... The imagery, when you say Bruce Lee, a lot of the imagery, also even in those like early kind of karate games, you know, the, like 1980s, do, 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 and there'd be a Bruce Lee character, and his technique would be something like this, a flying sidekick. And the flying sidekick is used in so many logos and films, and I am Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee Enterprise, and all this. So in, in the talk, what I want to talk about is Bruce Lee's iconic sidekick. I want to, because the theme is... Aesthetics before and after Bruce Lee. I want to think about psychic before Bruce Lee, uh, martial arts aesthetics before Bruce Lee, um, and then I want to think about the kind of ontological status or the real. Is this a real technique? Is this an effective technique, or is it cinematic? Is it spectacular? Um, and then you look. I'll say something about martial arts aesthetics immediately after Bruce Lee, and then if there's time, I want maybe discuss the Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee and martial arts. Aesthetics now. Um, so is sidekick. This image, I mean, this has been remediated, reiterated, and, and replayed in so many different ways by so many different people. Um, and it's hugely, hugely iconic. I think if there's anyone into the kind of the science of semiotics rather than just vaguely evoking semiotics, like I sometimes do, you could really do a lot in terms of the way in which this as a signifier comes to symbolize something um, and comes to and I kind of think it symbolizes and sums up it's like an iconic metonym or something would it be a synecdoche I don't know of, of the martial arts boom of the 70s so we'll have a little look at some of um, Bruce Lee's sidekicks if this plays <laughs> Then there's the analysis. YouTube's great for this stuff. People do all your work for you. So, the point of that, that short film that I found on YouTube is that there's something very real, there's something technically real in the kicks that Bruce Lee delivers on screen. They're, de they're delivered with force, they're delivered with power, they knock people over. They're a, they're a, but they're also hugely spectacular. They um, kind of signify the, the excess that martial arts kind of stood for on screen. So I want to single out the kick because I think it came to stand as an icon for Asian martial arts, for the difference between Asian martial arts and any other fighting styles that have been seen hitherto. The kind of the, the wrestling is, is, has a, a different... Wrestling. Wrestling. <laughs> wrestling. Boxing, these are much smaller, less kind of spectacular, less dramatic things. But the sidekick is like, it's almost excessive. The jumping sidekick 
seems to be you know, hugely excessive. So Bruce Lee did not invent the sidekick. Um, there have been sidekicks in, this is arguably a sidekick. It's arguably a kick to the knee, which of which Bruce Lee would approve. Bruce Lee in Jeet Kune Do mode and Bruce Lee in Wing Chun mode would agree that um, some kind of a stop hit like this, which is what the word Jeet means, I guess. And this comes from a European text uh, in 1409. Um, I think this was sent to me by Six Wetzler or possibly Eric Burkhardt. Um, as was this. So this is Jakob Happel in 1863. This text, I think this is uh, this was sent to me by Six as well as Six Wetzler. And there's some debate about whether this is actually discussing a sidekick, but they think that the text and the pictures do describe uh, a straight kick with the, with the heel or the bottom of the foot. So it's a sidekick. Um, and of course, Savat, um, La Box Francaise, um, has sidekicks, has turning kicks, has hoop kicks, has all sorts of kicks. There's actually some argument, some research suggests that um, Japanese martial arts got their interest in kicking from uh, French savat. Um, the person who's doing research or has done research in this area that I know most about is Jean-Francois Lutcher, uh, who is in um, Bordeaux. And his research suggests that because of different trade missions and, and diplomatic exchanges, the Japanese um, were really into savat <laughs> and incorporated the savat techniques into um, into their kicking styles. And of course, um, most famously, as yes, kicking art would be taekwondo, um, which even even taekwondo didn't specialize in high kicks the way that it does now until after the late fifties. Um, taekwondo always sought to distinguish itself from Japanese martial arts, as Martin can tell us all about. Um, because of the kind of striving for Korean cultural identity and the sense in which they didn't want their indigenous martial arts to be basically Japanese martial arts. So they tried to, to differentiate their style and they identified with the high kick um, and connected it back to older um, Korean folk practices like Taekyeon. Um So Taekwondo became the, the distinguishing high kick martial art. And actually Bruce Lee, arguably, because this is, this is June Ray who um, is someone who is famous for popular, popularizing Taekwondo in um, North America. And Bruce Lee was friends with him. Bruce Lee learned a lot from him. So arguably Bruce Lee's Kung Fu kicks were always kind of Taekwondo kicks um, originally, which would be, I think if the Taekwondo authorities got that idea, they'd jump on that. They should do that to popular, anyway. Talk about that later, maybe. Um, but, but Bruce Lee's ability on screen to deliver a sidekick and all of his techniques actually with apparent force is kind of legendary like if you look at the difference in in fight styles between uh, Bruce Lee and the type of um, wushu and kung fu films that we saw made in Hong Kong before Bruce Lee there's nothing like this kind of what we would call realism there's nothing like this kind of power delivery and affect um, taking place. It, so, it, you know, on screen, it's a real kick. It's not, it's not a pretend kick, but that's on screen. Um, so in section three, I think the big deal about Bruce Lee is, is the difference between what had been seen and known of martial arts in the West before Bruce Lee and then the transformation that Bruce Lee brought with his mainstreaming of this um, very, very flamboyant style of fighting. So I'll show you some examples of what we have to assume, or we have to conclude, is the dominant kind of understanding of what people thought martial arts were. Actually, the term martial arts wasn't commonly used. It was, martial arts was really popularized with Bruce Lee as a, an umbrella term for all of these different styles. And as it kind of originally referred to Asian martial arts, because people didn't necessarily think of boxing and wrestling as martial arts. People doing jiu-jitsu and judo in the 40s, 50s and 60s didn't think of themselves as doing martial arts. The term was used in technical publications and so on, but you, you did jiu-jitsu or you did judo or you did whatever, you, didn't, you weren't a martial artist. That was more of a recent kind of um, 
conceptual development. So jujitsu was arguably the dominant understanding or signified, if we say martial arts, the signified was jujitsu, and it was popularized in Britain at least, and I guess across Europe, from the early 1900s, uh, initially with a, um, a type of jujitsu called bartitsu, which uh, most people know about now. So, so Edward William Barton Wright worked in Japan as a railway engineer, he learned jujitsu, came back to Britain, and he was also an entrepreneur, and he was like, right, I'm going to make some money out of this. So he said, I'll teach you a new self-defense form. It's called Bartitsu, from the Barton and the Itsu, the Jitsu. Um, and that was quite successful. Um, and then that became surpassed by Jiu-Jitsu. But this was the, the kind of dominant aesthetic. Slightly forward, with his wrist and elbow. And by bending my knees, I lower my center of gravity. Roughly speaking, my hips below his center of gravity. And by bending my shoulders, I lower my center of gravity. Roughly speaking, my hips below his center of gravity. And by bending sharply forward. Oh. So you get the you get the gist, but um, <clears throat> jujitsu was also known um, in Hollywood context. So we we've actually got jujitsu in this um, Cary Grant film, The Awful Truth, from 1937. So this is some jujitsu, some Hollywood jujitsu from 1937. I'm Please, your name? Jerry Barnett. Is my wife here? Please, I do not know. What do you mean you don't know? Please, I only know I don't know. Yeah, well, you wouldn't mind if I looked around. Me too, me too. Me too, me too. Is that so? Me too, me too, too. So, I think it was worth it. I think it was worth it to see that, right? So, so it, it was worth it. So, me jujitsu, right? Um, actually, it, it's interesting because if you look at the early um, manuals, the self defense manuals, uh, are certainly the English language ones, or the, the ones written in uh, Britain and in America, when jujitsu started to kind of go into, into the consciousness of, of fighters and people who are into self-defense and combat. Um, Jiu-Jitsu was regarded as tricks. They always talked about tricks. So you have people writing self-defense stuff who are talking about wrestling and boxing and, and the, the staff. Um, and they'll go, but Jiu-Jitsu's got some good tricks. It was regarded not as some kind of overarching martial art that was distinct from, from European traditions, but was just it had some good tricks in it, like that. I'll trip you up, I'll trip you, and I'll, and I'll throw you, and all the rest of it. Um, it wasn't really regarded as something fundamentally different from, um, okay. from Western kind of wrestling. In the Second World War, I've talked about this before, I think that um, the training that was given to soldiers, certainly in the British and in the American forces, by uh, Fairburn and Sykes, um, was quite, and these are again were people who had studied. Um, so Fairburn had been uh, in charge of police in Shanghai, and he kind of set up the first riot police essentially. Um, and they, Fairburn and Sykes also invented some like hunting knife, which apparently is a really good hunting knife. Um, but Fairburn started to train troops during this during World War Two, and a lot of the techniques that were trained looked like what we would associate with martial arts. But actually, Fairburn thought that Westerners had, wouldn't be in, able to do martial arts. They would have, then he kind of thought it was bullshit. And he thought it was some kind of weird Chinese-Japanese thing. And that it was, and he stripped it down to what he thought were its bare bones. And essentially, well, we look at some of, we look at the, um, the video, some of the video. Episodes of the video. Starting from the beginning, here are the vulnerable points. First, And now the arms. The forearm, the upper part of the arm, then the back of the neck, the kidneys, base of the spine. Now comes the side of the neck and across the Adam's apple.
lastly, to round matters off, come shin and instep. And now we'll see how all these are attacked. The chin is there. Effective, isn't it? Faint to the fork, out comes the chin. Then an upward thrust for the heel of the hand with all your weight behind it, and down he goes back. Like I really like the way they've done it in slow motion as well. Um, so the, the basic training, uh, they call it dirty fighting, because it, it's not about, it's not a duel, it's about, it's about essentially killing your opponent as fast as possible. Um, and the basic techniques that they used were um, a kind of a claw, but to the face. So that was essentially, it was a, a palm heel smash but one that could become a gouge, but one that would lead seamlessly into a, into a drop, drop them down over backwards. And they also taught the, what they called a rabbit punch. I, didn't, I never knew what a rabbit punch was. You know, in boxing, they go, no this, no that, no rabbit punches. Rabbit punches, uh, apparently, is when a hunter has trapped a rabbit and it's like back of the neck to break. That's a rabbit punch, so it's like a chop. And the other thing they taught was a, a, what we would call an axe kick. So you heel down onto somebody's body. Oh, and jumping, just down to kill the person who you've dispatched on the ground. Really basic techniques. And you, there's videos of them training, and they'll be just doing this. Like, that's training. Um, anyway, so this is dirty fighting, and it's, it's, it's derived or informed by Sykes, especially Sykes' F. Fairburn's knowledge of um, Asian martial arts. But also a rejection of those because they're too, too. It's like the fancy mess or whatever Bruce Lee would call it. The fancy mess, the classical mess. Um, so this was this was um, a huge player in the notion of. Um, it's almost like an attempt to. It's like an aesthetics-free fighting, but one that comes over time. I think to, to have its own um, aesthetic form. Um, this was once presented to me as. First day, the first time that um, Japanese martial arts had been shown on screen, but I think um, we've already seen the 1937. We've seen our authentic and legitimate jiu jitsu. So, this is um, from a film called Bad Day at Black Rock in 1955. It, it goes on for a while. I might skip to the just the fighty bit. Oh, you're wrong with the top. So, it's your classic. You don't like my voice? And he's only got one arm. Why ever would he want to do that? So it's a kind of um, classic sort of set piece that actually when we watch it following the, the, the World War II military training, it's kind of, it's got that, but it's the, it's the chop. The chop is the thing. The karate chop. Or as there's like was sent up in the film Austin Powers, like judo chop, judo chop, and judo trip, right? And these are the, like the sneaky things associated with, with Asian martial arts. Chop. And trip, you don't trip, right? um, and it's it's so that's it's the newness, it's the difference of that. But we could easily just as easily tra trace that back to kind of American military training as we could to to Japan if we wanted to. Um, okay, by the nineteen fifties in Britain, judo was was the main because the history of the history of the importation of Asian martial arts into Britain at least went kind of bartitsu, then it was jiu-jitsu and suffragitsu, the suffragettes doing jiu-jitsu. And then after that it was judo. Judo became, judo kind of wiped, it's like the tide came in and swept away all the sandcastles made by these earlier things. And then I guess jiu-jitsu came back in a big way in the 1990s uh, with Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Judo was the first well-known martial arts style in Britain. In France probably even earlier, it's really well known. I mean, the very first essay in, in Roland Barthes' book Mythologies, which is 1957, talks about the, state, the difference between wrestling and judo, as if everyone reading that will, will know all about judo, which I think is a big deal. Um, judo was followed by, by, by karate, I guess, as the next big martial art. Um, judo for a long time was 
um, was held up as the kind of mythic exemplar of supreme fighting ability. You know the way now people go, oh, he does Krav Maga. <laughs> it was judo first. <gasps> he does judo. So like the, the bad guy in uh, from Russia with love is uh, skilled in boxing and judo, um, which is a foreign, it's like it's the, it's the superlative martial art. I don't really want to watch this uh, fight scene because there's no boxing and there's no judo in it. Um, but I guess it's it's sort of meant to be a cinematic representation of these things, but it's just like theatrical swinging on a door frame. And it's the, it's the classic like knee chop. It's like what we've just seen, the easiest things to choreograph, using props in different ways. It's not boxing, it's not judo. Um, it's just spectacular, spectacular. So I don't really want to watch that. Um, Martial arts aesthetics were hugely popularized by this television show, The Avengers and The New Avengers, um, through the 60s. And no one, well, on the one hand, most of what you see is, again, no martial arts. It's just like, it's a bit like wrestling and people throwing each other around and hitting with a chair and there'll be a gadget and a gizmo and some poison gas. and It's like that kind of nonsense. But... As the series went on, they did incorporate actual um, martial arts choreography into it. So Diana Rigg um, was awarded a Guinness World Record for being the first Western actress to perform Kung Fu on television in 1965. Um, so the, the fight choreographers were um, actually somewhat knowledgeable in Kung Fu. But it was all just like this. It was just... Um, not really Kung Fu. And it's very, very um, stylized, but a completely made up stylized. There was no, um, it's a bit like in the remake of the Karate Kid. So in the first Karate Kid, if, if, the, if, this, was the, if this was the gimmick, in the 2010 remake, he, he has some weird stance that's just been made up. <laughs> that's like, and then he does some impossible kick just because it has to be different from the standard. Um, it's the most preposterous, that remake of the Karate Kid, isn't it? That like, and then he does like some cobra thing. Anyway, um, this is interesting to me. Um, I think I think that the um, the Pink Panther and the the, the sequel, a shot in the dark, did a huge amount to um, to put to put a martial arts aesthetic <laughs> into the mainstream because Inspector Clouseau has told his manservant, butler, whatever he is, helper, to attack him whenever, whenever. And like, these are the rules. So he keeps attacking him at completely inappropriate times. And it's, and it's a source of much comedy in, in these films. But also, I mean, we, we see, like we've got Nunchakus here in 1964. I mean, we associate, we think of them as something that really Bruce Lee brought into the, into the world, but um, the cinematic world. But there's Cluso already using Nunchakus in 1964. Um, the thing that I really like about this is that we laugh and we ridicule like how stupid the whole thing is and this, the very idea of it. But actually, the, the kind of psychological training of this is totally legit. It's like all the stuff that you read about when you see videos about the predator mindset, you've got to be ready for being attacked all the time. You should have constantly, a, like, DEFCON 1, DEFCON 2, like, like where are we at? Like, here I feel like we might be DEFCON 1. I don't feel like someone's going to leap out and attack me, so maybe I should really be on DEFCON 2 because I don't know some of these people and, and, and Martin's here. And <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it's ludicrous, but actually there's, 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 there's something serious going on here. It's a serious piece of commentary. Comedy is is a is a very important um, is a very important genre that that people often overlook when they talk about uh, martial arts history and martial arts aesthetics. And it's something that I I like to focus on because I think that it um, uh, can teach us a lot. So um, Elvis was famously a karateka, um, and there's some dispute about the status of Elvis's martial arts, right? <laughs> but the guy who gave him a black belt, I think it was like Dan Parker or someone like this, Ed Parker or someone. Um, and there's, there's letters between um, 
Elvis's instructor and other people. And the bit that I always remember from the letters is someone saying, the kid's not pretty, but he's tough. And it's like, you just got a black belt from just being like, ooh. You could hit him and he wasn't bothered. And he'd like, hit, boom. And it just like, he's kind of like, hope smash. <laughs> <laughs> so Elvis popularized um, uh, martial arts as well. So this is um, a 1964 film, Roust About, right? The dialogue's interesting. Is that your sickle? Gotta stop reading those hot rod magazines, buddy. So it's it's absolutely. I mean, the 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 karate is is you know I've read a review. This is like yellow belt karate, right? That's the level of it, right? But by the sixties, I guess in this, I'm like, oh no, that's karate. It's this Japanese thing. That the whole the all the discourse is about is that Japanese motorbike? Why don't you call it a sickle anymore? It's a bike. It's a motorbike, and it's like, uh, and and then he's doing Japanese martial arts. There's a, there's a kind of it registers something about Japan. In the 1960s, which is the, the place of, of Japan um, in American consciousness, I think the interest in in Japanese stuff in America after the Second World War, but also the the kind of anxieties about what that means about American cultural identity is registered in there. And here, Elvis is a new multicultural progressive kid. I wrote I, I wrote an, um, an article about this about dialogue. Um, it was for an, it was for an issue of the journal on film dialogue. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll do something on martial arts discourse in, in mainstream film. Things that people say about martial arts in films. Um, because often martial arts is just a visual thing that happens. But I scoured as many films as I could possibly find to look at what the discourse of martial arts was and what that tells us about what people thought about martial arts in those films. And it, this is an interesting film. Uh, the most interesting film, I think, is probably Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> It's a film, it's a, it's a fantastically important film in the history of martial arts discourse and martial arts aesthetics. I should have just done Napoleon Dynamite. Because if you think about Napoleon Dynamite, like, he's all about, you know, girls that dig skills, you know, bow hunting skills, nunchuck skills, like, girls want skills, right? But his brother, he's training to be an MMA fighter. So, so Napoleon's into, like, your kind of classical cinematic... Japanese and Chinese martial arts, but his brother is into the new emerging discourse of UFC, MMA, and then of course you've got Rex Kondo, yeah. which, is, which you practice, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love that film so much. We should just do all conference on Napoleon Dynamite and how great it is. Um, <laughs> <Black Dynamite. laughs> oh, so there's tons and tons of examples, of course. So big ones. The Green Hornet that Bruce Lee was in the 60s, The Saint, yeah. um, which is kind of a James Bond type television series, increasingly using martial arts choreography. The Billy Jack films, um, these were big, these, these were in the, these were of the 60s. So these, so this guy's doing um, like Hapkido, a Tang Sudo, um, which is essentially Aikido and, and karate, right? Um, but the, there's the, some good stuff there. I mean, that, that was, this is paving the way for, for the Kung Fu craze, I think. So much more. And uh, we can't underestimate, we can never underestimate the importance of the Kung Fu television series in putting our, our martial arts aesthetics um, out there. And also with this one, I think, you get this, the Kung Fu television series popularised that kind of notion of pacifism. And that it's a, we're doing a Buddhist martial art, and therefore it's only for defence, and you shouldn't be aggressive. And it's like that comes from California, mate. That, that idea it doesn't it doesn't really come from anywhere else. Um, but that's a, still a tenacious thing. Um, the number of times I've been asked about that when I used to do Asian martial arts, you know, isn't it meant to be for defence? You know, yeah. <laughs> it depends how you want to live your life, you know. But anyway, so I write about all this stuff. Um, so it's into this kind of a context that Bruce Lee um, appears. 
And I think that what, what's unique about Bruce Lee is it's hard to put into words what's unique about Bruce Lee, right? Like, what is it? His charisma, his, his je ne sais quoi, his, like, you know, like, what is it about Bruce Lee? But something about how singularly brilliant he was, um, how fast he was, and how he could really put the sense of, of the delivery of power. He could make the techniques look like they were really, really being thrown with force. What were we talking about last night? Gong and far. Like, mm. real gong there, real boom. Um, and I guess he had, he had good people working with him to really, like, sell those techniques properly. Um, but the, there's still the interminable question of, um, of the, uh, could, does that mean he could really fight? Like, that, that's the question, isn't it, all the time? Like, could Bruce Lee really fight? People still ask me questions about, did Bruce Lee ever have any real fights? Did he really win? What happened? And it's because, it's because of this uncertainty that's opened up by the fact that he's so obviously brilliant on screen. But what was, it, what was his real fight? What, what would that really look like? He was super fast. We have a little quick. What time is it? No, we won't. We'll skip through the, how fast he is because we, we watched the film last night. So we'll stick with. Um, so the question is, this is section four. Is his technique spectacle or is it reality? Is this just a spectacular cinematic technique or is it, is it real? And I'll skip through that. Now, there's an easy answer, which is, which is unsatisfactory actually, that, um, that cinematic techniques are high or big and real techniques are small. So, so if in a film you're going to do a head kick or whatever, or a side kick, in real life you might just do a stock kick to check their knee or take their knee out or a shin kick or something low. Or maybe, you know, the, the idea in Wing Chun, you know, you would never kick higher than the groin because this is, and you can recover your balance faster and everything. So that's the easy answer. Cinematic Jeet Kune, this is something that Dan Inosanto would say as well. Cinematic Jeet Kune Do is the big high stuff. And real Jeet Kune Do, street Jeet Kune Do is the low stuff. But that's not really borne out by um, Bruce Lee's own like, self-defense lessons. So you have a book like Bruce Lee's Fighting Method, which came out posthumously, and Bruce Lee didn't have a lot to sort of say, therefore, in the layout of the book and the structure of the book. But in the book, the sidekick is presented as the first kick in so many self-defense scenarios. The, end, the chapter of the first cover, the book cover, the first page, the contents page, and all the way through chapter one, the defense against different forms of attack, chapter one, the first chapter that you're going to read is a sidekick. So contents page, sidekick, defense against surprise attack, sidekick, Someone who's going to go, oh, I'm not sure like, that that would be your physiological response to it. It might be, but I'm not, I'm not sure about the, that, just looking at that picture. If I'm going to surprise attack you and take out my knee, I'm not sure that I do that. Anyway, um, so it's, that might, this might be staged. <laughs> uh, ambush from the rear. Oh, sidekick. Um, okay, fine. But, I mean, there's, I've worried about this as well, because there's a, that's a massively telegraphed attack. It's like that kind of Jim Carrey sketch. <laughs> <laughs> stab yeah, me properly. You can't stab me properly. Attack me properly. <laughs> uh, so it's a, bit, it's a bit pantomime, maybe, maybe. Um, again, so look, this is psychic to the... Side and back of the knee. Um, defense against an unarmed assailant. Side kick. These are all like just the. These are the only pictures in this chapter. Um, defense against a crouching attack. Guess what it is. Side kick. Crouching attack. Okay. Never really thought of that. Attack and a crouching attack. What's this one? Defense against a re reverse punch. Side kick. Defense against a full swing, side kick. So, 
I know that Bruce Lee didn't write this book, but he's got all of this archive of material in which this is his go-to response to a real attack. So, but even then, just because I, I could write a self-defense book, right? I haven't been in that many fights, you know? I might say, it shouldn't be a sidekick. It should be a elbow. Upward elbow. Defense against someone coming through the door, elbow. Defense against someone shouting at you, elbow. Um, and you might buy that, and you might, you, might, um, you might believe me, but the question, I mean, we could ask lots of questions about this. We could ask lots of questions about the construction of the book, lots of questions about the status of Bruce Lee's authority as someone who could speak about self-defense. And also, the question that interests me is the one about, was the sidekick derived from the cinematic spectacle? Or is his faith in the sidekick something that he carried into cinema? Like, what's the kind of status of that as a technique? And I think that the answer seems to be that if you train it, you can use it, right? So there's this very famous quote from Miyamoto Musashi called, you can only fight the way you practice, which isn't from Musashi. Musashi never said that anywhere. It's not written down. It's not in any of his writing. There's no translation that comes. I actually emailed Alexander Bennett, who's translated the complete Musashi, and said, have you ever seen, because there's memes everywhere. M Musashi says this. Musashi never said that. But it kind of aligns with sort of his argument, like you have to train and fight properly. And there's the US Army kind of uh, motto, which is, you know, train as you fight, fight as you train. Um, there's lots of, there's lots of kind of platitudes and, and axioms around this. And I think that the significance of these um, uncertain interventions into discourse, there's discourse about fighting, there's discourse about what fighting looks like, it's going on all the time. And I think that Bruce Lee's intervention, the cinematic ones, and he's put so much power into the kicks, and, and textbooks like this, which, did he author it, kind of, did he author it, or did he not author it? What that does is it puts out a new theory into the world about what fighting looks like and what, what technique should be. So if you train this stuff, and there's lots of theorists who would agree with me here, Foucault, Bourdieu, Judith Butler, Peter Sloterdijk, the exercise makes you what what the exercise determines what you can do. You train your training determines how you react um, and how you move. So if you train this as your go-to technique, then it can become as real as, as any other technique, as real as a punch or a throw or a chop or anything like this. And I think that way we get to at the end of this kind of analysis is that the ontological stability or reality of fighting is something that's really complex. There's only ever context and shifting senses, shifting responses to shifting forms of, uh, of threat or attack or action. So we can't, we shouldn't really maintain this distinction between reality and fiction because Bruce Lee's cinematic intervention, his book interventions, whether, whether he has the, whether he has the authority of Musashi or someone, to tell you how to fight doesn't make any difference. It goes into discourse. People respond to that, and people go, "Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do Jeet Kune Do. Then I'm gonna learn it from this book." Um, so I think that we need stronger, far stronger theoretical categories about what exists and what doesn't exist, ontological categories than reality and fiction. Um, and we need to think about the kind of status of performativity, performativity, and anthropotechnics, as Sloterdijk calls them, the way in which the way that we train determines what we become. Um, so th there's a term, there's a pair of terms that I was going to talk about if Max had been here, which would be the difference between soma. Oh, there's soma techniques, like what you learn how to do with your body, and what you learn and it teaches your body to do so. And there's also the soma aesthetics of it. There is something inherently delightful about delivering a, a, a beautiful sidekick. It's like one of my, one of the favourite kicks to land perfectly. So we shouldn't get also too bogged down in like notions of efficiency, because even when we're doing something efficiently, we also kind of want to be doing it beautifully. There's a soma aesthetics to doing even the most ugly, brutal, short technique right, 
there's still a kind of aesthetic beauty to it in within a certain set of frames. Um, so we're going to finish soon. -ish. Yeah, not much longer then. Um, so to think about martial aesthetics after Bruce Lee. I thought, well, there's a whole universe of stuff because, like, Bruce Lee founded this kind of. Um, Bruce Lee raised the bar on fight choreography, and there's been any number of attempts, uh, attempts to move on from that and develop that. So it's very, very hard to say something all encompassing. But I wanted to um, go back to the kind of comic, the role of comedy. I think that um, after Bruce Lee, Kung Fu inevitably became a joke because there's lots of reasons why it became a joke. But a figure like Hong Kong Fui, who there's, there's only like 10 episodes or something of Hong Kong Fui ever made, but it's, does, do we know Hong Kong Fui? Has anyone, you, you haven't seen, you have to, you have bloody children. <laughs> it was a, Hong Kong Fui, right, is a dog and he's a janitor in a police station and he's black. So his voice is, is, a, is a black actor's voice. And he's completely obsessed with Kung Fu. So whenever there's a crime report and he hears it, he's like, right. And he, and he turns into Hong Kong Fu. He puts his uh, Hong Kong Fu out there. And he consults the Hong Kong Book of Kung Fu, right? Every, every episode. So he's learning his Kung Fu from a book. And I think that this kind of text distills, it condenses a lot of the jokes about martial arts of the 70s, that black people are into them, that people, del and also he's rubbish, like, he'll try and do, consult the Hong Kong Book of Kung Fu, and then he's like, yeah, woo, yeah, ha, ha, and then nothing happens, or something falls on his head, or whatever, and his cat, his sidekick, who's a cat, solves the problem, just straightforward, kind of a way. It's like, Kung Fu and martial arts generally become something ridiculous, that people delude themselves, they're learning it from a book. I mean, that's, a, that's an ongoing joke, isn't it? Like in the car, kids learn from book. Um, yeah, so the aesthetics kind of shifted to a, a kind of camp um, comedy aesthetic that I think is captured most purely in this song. You must know this song. You know this song, even though you're children. Oh! Yeah? Dance to it, and it's yes, you have. <laughs> you can't help it as soon as it starts. But and it's been it's been reused in lots of different versions throughout the Kung Fu Panda films and stuff. And it's been used in there's like a, a, a Wii dance game. There's a whoa, ho, ho, you know when kids get that game and, and then they have to copy the dance moves and they're holding the thing. And, and there's there's this song's there and it's very very everybody was come and it's all this sort of stuff. Um, so if we look at a text like this, which is enduringly popular, I think that you could connect... Th well, this song is about having watched a Bruce Lee film uh, and, ha and having gone to Chinatown and watched a Kung Fu display. Bruce Lee has to be connected with the development of this kind of aesthetic. So it's Orientalism, it's camp, it's a joke, but we love it, right? It's That's kind of um, part of Bruce Lee's legacy as well. Not just the cool choreography that people will talk about, and how amazing the choreography was. This kind of aesthetic, um, the way in which martial arts becomes a joke, like in Napoleon Dynamite, um, you've got to have nunchuck skills to, to get a girl, right? Um, okay. So, I um, I did some in-depth research. <laughs> took you 44 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> 0.44. 0. 0. 0. 0. <laughs> detailed research, right? Like that is in depth, right? And I decided that we, <laughs> we can't really <laughs> capture this um, about the, the, you know, there's nothing definitive or final to say about Bruce Lee and martial arts aesthetics. But um, I think what we can do is now we can look at the, the question of the, 
the way in which Bruce Lee is being commemorated or remembered. So I learned last week that Ang Lee is making a Bruce Lee biopic. Mm. So we'll see, right? And all of these, I mean, how many Bruce Lee biopics, how many different ways of remembering him, how many people are trying to own Bruce Lee um, in different ways and do different things? It, it, because it's a matter of kind of cultural memory now. Um, this was, the surprising thing about this scene in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is how quickly this became the controversial issue of the film. Mm -hmm. So Tarantino films normally are very, very violent. There's normally something hideously violent, and there is in this, kind of. Um, but this is the thing, this is where, because people were outraged that you could depict, have you seen this depiction of Bruce Lee? Let's have a look, let's have a look. So this, so Bruce Lee, uh, this is Cliff Booth, who is a stuntman and a body double. Um, and this is Bruce Lee, who's evidently in his role um, as Kato in the Green Hornet, um, and they're on some kind of a, a, a film set. So. And that's the end of the scene, essentially. Um, so there was a lot of um, controversy around this, but there's a lot of there is a lot of Bruce Lee distilled into this caricature and this parody, and I think that maybe when we look at these things, especially the comic things like this, especially the the kind of um, over the top excessive representations of things like Bruce Lee, that's when we can start to unpack them and we can start to learn a lot about the discursive status or the cultural status of of something like you know the Bruce Lee's legacy. This is the most recent controversial representation of Bruce Lee. We'll see what the Ang Lee thing looks like. There's other things as well. There's documentaries and galore being made about Bruce Lee. Um, but I think that, you know, there's, there's basically too much to say about Bruce Lee's aesthetic. So you've got to kind of decide which way you're going to approach it. Um, and I like to look at the, the, the media states of it. And I think that if I'm called upon to um, give an answer to the question of um, the ontological status of the sidekick, right, Bruce Lee's sidekick, or, or how good a fighter Bruce Lee really was. I think that you can only, I would do it from like a media and cultural studies point of view and say that Bruce Lee was so good at fighting that he actually changed what people thought fighting is. So, like, you have to think about that maybe for a little while. Bruce Lee changed, like, the discourse of fighting. What does fighting look like? What's superlative fighting? What's the ultimate fighting? And that probably stayed in place, more or less, until 1993 with the UFC, the first UFC, when ultimate fighting, uh, the ultimate fighting became wrestling, um, which confused everyone, because everyone thought ultimate fighting involved jumping about. With... But then they've, they've constantly tweaked the rule sets and contracts and everything of UFC fighters to make it more spectacular. To kind of, you know, you reward and you hire fighters who, um, who give you what you want, which is jumping kicks. Um, so yeah, I think I've said more than enough. So I will um, just say thank you and leave it at that. Thank you very much. <laughs>